And it seems to me, listening to your, reading you as a writer for many years and now listening to your podcast, it seems that I can observe a really fascinating development opening up that you have been one of the people who's really seen the potential of all the ways you can tell a story with sound, as opposed to, you know, you've, you've made this unusual journey in a way of not moving away from the printed page, but really seeing the full potential. Um, so what was the research that you did to begin to pull together? I'm going to say all the elements now of the podcast and the audiobook. Of course, we want people to buy the book itself, um, but they can buy the audiobook and indeed listen to the podcast. So how does that work in, in pulling, that, pulling that together for us to listen to? Well, I have a team. You know, one of the things, three years ago, my best friend and I started this company, Pushkin Industries, to make audio things. And <coughs> from the beginning, our our understanding was that making an audiobook is a very different kind of process or a podcast than writing a book or, or a magazine article. It's a team project. Um, so... You know, you have you're surrounded by people who are, um, who are kind of um, who are thinking about the audio dimension, who are experts in that area. Com you know, I have a composer that we use in the, both in this book and in the podcast. I have a, a researcher who is brilliant and managed to uncover all this incredible archival audio. I have. An editor who comes out of audio, who edits for the ear, not for the eye, um, and on and on and on. And that, you know, so it's not, it hasn't been this kind of difficult, traumatic transition for me because I've, I've been kind of um, escorted into this new world by a whole series of experts. So, um, you know, the, the, that made, that's made it a lot easier. And I, I, can't believe um, that any anyone in our audience hasn't listened to your podcast or audiobooks, but in case you haven't, I urge you to do so. Um, we have two questions that I'm going to um, put together, which are questions about um, about women um, and women in the book or or the lack of them. Um, to what extent is bombing led by men? And how much can we say bombing is a gendered or traditionally masculine reaction? And someone else asks, are there any women in the book? And is was this problem of destruction um, about a, a load of men making these explosive decisions? Uh, there are a handful of women in the book. Um, there are not more because we're telling the story of a moment in history which is entirely male. There's no women in the upper echelons of the Air Forces of the United States or England at this time. There are no women who are teaching at the Air Force Tactical School in Montgomery, Alabama, where the bomber mafia come from. There are no women in the bomber mafia. I mean, it's sort of a joke. I remember having a discussion with one of my producers, and she said, you know, she's always urging me to have more female voices. And I was like, you know, Mia is her name. It's like, usually I listen to Mia. And in fact, in the most, the upcoming ep uh, season of Revisionist History, is overwhelmingly female voices. It's probably 80% female voices. Um, so it is something that we think a lot about because um, when you think about female voices, you do tell different kinds of stories and you listen to different people. Um, there's no women <laughs> to be found. The one thing I tried, there was a woman in England called Vera Britton, who's well known in England, who was a major op opponent of the British bombing campaigns of the 1930s um, or 1940s. We tried so hard to find Vera Britton tape, couldn't, and then tried to interview Vera Britton's daughter, who's Shirley Williams, the British politician. Um, but I think she's um, past the point where she wants to do interviews anymore. So um, we were kind of thwarted on that front. But yeah, it's this is a male world. Um, continues to be a male world today. Well, but in 1945, it was a 100% male world. Thinking about the world today, 
Um, and you talked about, you mentioned drones at one point, um, and you come round to the fact that we've come back to very precise mm. ideas of bombing in the 21st century. Um, and Mark Dawkins asks, do you have a sense of the forefront of combat technology and strategy today? How do you think America would wage city warfare in the 20th century, in the 21st century? Well, I think we know that to a to a certain extent. Um, but how much did you become aware of what's going on now? Well, it became one, what's going on now is what the bomber mafia were dreaming of back in the 1930s in Alabama. Um, now we really do have precision bombing. I mean, if I, <clears throat> if you picked up a phone, if I had revealed myself in this conversation to be a terrorist, you could pick up a phone and if you knew what number to call, the U.S. Air Force could send, I mean, if they wanted to, they could send a B-1 bomber. They could also just do a drone strike, and they could take me out where I stand and leave the rest of the room intact, right? They knew I was here. They, if you gave them my exact GPS coordinates, do a little hole in the roof, boom, Malcolm's gone. Everything else is still there. That's what we're dealing with today. I mean, we are... A world apart from the days when you had to level an entire city block if you wanted to take out one person. Um, I've just looked at um, the questions, um, and um, it, someone has told us um, that Shirley Williams and I hadn't seen this um, just died on the eleventh of April, oh, which dear. I, I which I was not aware of. Yeah. Um, so I I share that with you. Yeah. Um, right now. Um, but so, yes, yeah, so we've come back around um, to this idea of precision bombing. Um, what did you feel that the, the consequences of these experiments that were made before and during the Second World War for not just the future of bombing, but the future of warfare in general? Well, you know, they got people... I think they kind of pricked the consciences of people in military circles in a way that was very useful. It was not ultimately productive in the sense it changed the course of the war, but I did think it introduced the notion to people who had come out of the carnage of the First World War that we didn't have to fight war that way, that there are ways to use technology to reduce that kind of unspeakable human damage. Um, and that the public was also was made aware of the fact that war didn't have to be this thing that claimed the lives of an entire generation. Um, and I think it kind of, more generally beyond war, it kind of was a, served as a very useful role model of how people in the forefront of any technological revolution have an obligation to ask moral questions. Um, uh, that you can't pretend that technology exists in a kind of vacuum. And that one of the reasons I want to tell this, this story now is that um, I do think there are lots of people in the technological world who think that their ideas operate in a vacuum. They're, um, they're not sensitive, as sensitive as they should be to the fact that you know, you create a social media platform. It can facilitate benign social interaction. It can also open up a Pandora's box. And you're responsible. you got to think about that, right? You can't just shrug off the kind of collateral effects of your new idea. Um, the bomber mafia were unusual and um, exemplary, in my, to my mind, in that they did think about that other dimension. And that's why they were... I think such a fascinating topic for um, for examination. I wonder if there's a, a danger though in the in the present day because of that idea that war can be so precise, so called. Mm -hmm. um, the United States has just announced, for better or worse, that it's going to be pulling out of Afghanistan um, after 20 years of being there, and I wonder if these if you think that these 
this kind of endless war is facilitated by what I might say the fiction that we can just kind of pick off the pick people that we need. Yeah. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, that that worry that you've just articulated was um, said to me by the chief of staff of the U.S. Air Force, the guy who runs the Air Force. I mean, they think about this every day. Um, uh, you know, they are charged with carrying out the decisions of civilian leadership, and they are fully aware that if you can wage war without going to war, it's a lot easier to wage war. Um, you know, the political consequences are a lot smaller if you're not sending young men off into battle, young men and women off into battle. Um, so I think that the new approach is not without its limitations. But am I happy we're no longer in a world where we have to destroy entire cities in order to achieve a military objective? Yes, I am. I think all of us should be. Uh, here's a question that's kind of allied, um, allied to that. Um, someone asks whether, uh, asks, do you think uh, humankind, Homo sapiens, becomes more or less moral when death is delivered from far away by bombers and drones? Do you think it has an effect on our morality? You know, I don't know. I think it's a really good question. And I don't know whether anyone at this point has a good answer to that. Um, not, I think if you told me right now that if I pressed a button, somebody would die in Afghanistan, would that somehow be less meaningful than maybe a little bit, but I think I would still, it would still haunt me. I mean, I, I don't know. I, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastically important question with all kinds of ramifications, but I do not know the answer. One of the things that I enjoy most about your storytelling is how often I am surprised. I feel that that's one of the effects that you want to make for me is to cause me to think about things in a way that um, I didn't think about them before, as I hinted at in my introduction. I wonder what was most surprising for you in the, I won't, I won't just say the writing of this book, but putting together this story and all of its aspects. Mm -hmm. If there's something that really kind of stands out that you didn't, that you didn't expect or was really astonishing for you. I mean, it's like, I was struck by the intensity of the idealism of the bomber mafia in the 1930s. This idea that this group of young men really thought that they had resolved the central moral question of their time, which was that, you know, war was, war brought with it unimaginable and unspeakable human costs. And they thought they could resolve that. And the intensity of their belief and the power of their idealism are things that I find just enormously admirable. Um, and I wish there was more of that um, in the way we think about difficult problems. And I was, I suppose I was struck by stories of personal courage. I think it would be hard, as you said at the beginning of our talk, um, Curtis LeMay is either the hero or the villain of this book, depending on how we think about it. Um, but his own personal courage in leading bombing raids himself was very, that was very striking to me. Can you say something about that? Yeah, so LeMay is the anti-bomber mafia guy. And as much as they are morally sensitive, he appears to be morally insensitive. But at the same time, he's, he has, one of the things I try in the book is to kind of humanize him a little bit. He's been caricatured by historians. And that's not entirely fair to him either. He just had a different answer to the question of how to resolve the, um, the kind of horror of war. He thought that you didn't make war more palatable by making it, by waging war more selectively. What you did was, what you ought to do is to make war more palatable by making it shorter. And shorter for him meant you go in there and you fight as ferociously and as 
brutally as possible. And if war ends in six months instead of six years, <clears throat> you're ahead of the game morally. That's a moral position. I mean, it's a it's a more complicated position, but it's not. It is not an unthinking position, and that's the view that eventually supplants the moral the bomber mafia's idealism. Uh, is is Curtis LeMay's much more utilitarian, kind of cut and dried approach to how to limit losses in warfare. And that's that's finally. Um, the idea that we come to at the end of this story is that the flattening of those cities shortened the war and there would have been a, a great many more deaths without those that already terrible death toll. Mm -hmm. That's certainly what the military leadership in the United States believed at the time. Um, Do you believe it? <laughs> Do I believe it? Uh, I don't know. You know, one of the things I wanted to avoid in this book was to try and tie. I didn't want to tie everything up in a neat bow. I wanted to. It's a complicated, messy story, and that's why the story is so fascinating. Um, and I think you have to kind of engage with that complexity and sit with it for a long time before you make up your mind. And I'm still sitting with it. You know, um, I may be sitting with it for quite a long time, and I expect many listeners or readers will sit with it for a long time as well. That's certainly what I came away with, was thinking that this is a problem to which there is no good solution. Mm -hmm. You introduce us to a lot of people who believe they have a good solution, mm -hmm. but in fact, there isn't one. And that brings me back to that little museum that you went to um, and the and the voices of the people that you heard there, the Japanese people who enough of them still alive to to tell their stories of that time and and their their shocking stories. Yeah, yeah, they are shocking stories. Um, well, we have come to the end of our evening together. Um, I'm so grateful to you, Malcolm, for spending time with us. Um, I urge everyone um, to buy The Bomber Mafia, to listen to the audiobook, to download it, or indeed to listen to Revisionist History. Um, thank you to How to Academy. Thank you to Penguin Live. And thank you to all of our audience for coming. And good night, Malcolm. It was wonderful to meet you.